Good morning. Welcome to Bible study today, everyone. We're glad you're here. Today we're going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 6, God at work protecting Elisha. Um, and it starts with a, a rather, I think, mundane, ordinary story about an axe head getting dropped in some water. Um, and so if you, if you turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6, we'll get ourselves uh, started with the word of prayer. Lord, lead us to use the property that you have given to us and the property we borrow from others wisely. Uh, give us the wisdom to know how the gifts that you have provided can be used uh, with compassion for others. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. All right, so we have a series of stories from chapter 5 and forward that don't have a a strong timeline. There's not this linear, this happened and this happened. See the link between them all. These are kind of stories that are somewhat independent of each other. Um, and you could, uh, I sometimes think about what the oral character of the Old Testament was, that these stories would be shared and then the editor of the Book of Kings would bring them together. Uh, Jeremiah is sometimes seen as that editor that would have brought together First Kings and Second Kings together. And so you have these elements of oral communication here, of stories that are, are brought together about the life of Elisha and how he's working together to keep God's people together. We'll start by reading chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, and each of us get there a log, let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, Go. Then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. <laughs> then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. All right, we're going to start with this kind of opening question, a little fluffy maybe. But also, I don't know, maybe this would be awkward if the person you borrowed from is right near you. But what have you borrowed that you still haven't returned? Have any of you borrowed something that you haven't returned? My crutches, all right, yes. Uh, Hannah borrowed my crutches. Um, May I never need them back in my house, so. Yes. Um, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Uh, Chris Tucker, uh, I don't know, an actor who was in comedy movies, uh, who was being interviewed this last week and, and talked about what it was like becoming an up and coming actor. He said he was friends with Charlie Sheen and he borrowed Charlie Sheen's Lamborghini. And then he didn't return it after a while to the point where uh, Charlie Sheen said, you know, I haven't seen my Lamborghini. Do you know who has it? And Chris Tucker's sitting there going, will he remember? And then he finally says, I have it. And then Charlie goes, do you think he could bring it back? <laughs> um, yeah. You. When my dad was in his 80s, I borrowed his extension ladder. You still have it? Give it back to him. No, I, I still have my dad's snowblower. Yeah. There, there was, he was supposed to borrow it and not return it. So that his mother was that. She couldn't climb up it. Yeah, she couldn't climb up it. That's right. I get it. Oh, I get it, though. <laughs> when you borrow something, there's a, a certain uh, debt of, ex, of expecting that you would return it in the same condition you found it. Um, often you will borrow something because you don't have it. Maybe you don't have it because you couldn't afford it, or maybe you don't have it because you think regularly you're, you're not gonna need it long term and you're gonna use that person a little bit like a co-op of tools and borrow it and then return it to them. Uh, here we've got the son of a prophet, he borrows an ax, um, and it's likely because of poverty that he has borrowed it. And so there you see the great distress about it being borrowed and, and now in the water. Uh, if he had had the resources but just didn't have the ongoing need for the axe head, I don't think he would have been as alarmed about being borrowed because then he would be like, well, I'll just buy another. But the fact that he's so alarmed about it being borrowed and, and lost gives us a sense that it might be about debt. 
we've got this phrase, the sons of the prophets. Uh, this is a phrase that uh, likely refers to students who have gathered around Elisha for the advantage of learning and counsel. And they make it known to Elisha that the place where they dwell had gotten too small. So why did they seek Elisha's approval to make it bigger? He's the head of the school, kind of like, yeah, there's that. And there's another reason as well. It's going to involve a change of location. Because he's, they say, you know, let us get a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. So um, they're, they're asking Elisha, not only do we want a bigger school, we want to move locations. And so that would be a good reason to ask the head teacher why. Um, what could have been some of the reasons Elisha would say no? So when you ask someone something, there is the possibility they could say no. So I, I kind of thought one reason might be he doesn't want to go and move the school near the Jordan. Another one might be he wants to keep it small. That there's an advantage to the closeness and the intimacy of uh, the size of the school that has been developed here. And that if it gets larger, like a glass of water, more students will start to fill the space and it could be too big. But he... He answers, uh, go. Uh, and then the son, sons of the prophets wanted Elisha to go with them to the Jordan. It, it would appear that there's no plan in place prior to that that he would automatically go with them. Why do you think they asked Elisha to go with them? Now, we don't have any record of him being a, a well-known builder or architect, huh? so they might not have asked him to come for those skills. They were polite. They were polite. All right. Yeah, would you please come with us? Uh, it's, if you're going to talk about a party in front of other people, you should probably invite those people to the party. I do think that things seem to go better if Elijah's on board with the idea and along for the ride. And Yeah, so if Elisha is there, it's good. Probably something could happen. It, it'd be nice to have uh, a man of God around. So it shows... Maybe somewhat their, their, their sense of being still novices, uh, that uh, they wouldn't want to do such a grand task without his presence. Um, and, and maybe he would have liked if they could go do it without him. That might have shown their sense of growth. But when they ask, he goes. Now question four, why all the worry over a lost axe head? So we've got in verse five, but as one was felling a log, his axe head by the way, just ax with an E or without an E? How do you decide? E. 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 With an E always? Always. So, <laughs> by the way, I didn't get any red squiggly line under this AX word. <laughs> it's this a two letter word. Scrabble word, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. It's either. And it doesn't even say V A R period being invariant. All right, so anyways, verse 5. But strong opinions in this room. It there is. <laughs> but as one was fell into a log, his axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. So what, what, what reason is he so alarmed? Well, he borrowed it. Well, he borrowed it, yeah. You, you want to return it back uh, to the man he borrowed it from? Uh, and why does Elisha care about the place where it fell? So... The man of God said, where did it fall? Um, so he can get it. So he can get it, which is, in the end of the story, we know the conclusion. It sounds logical. But it sounds like, to everyone else, it seemed like, well, it's, it's gone. Why does it matter where it fell? It's gone. But for Elisha, it's not gone. And, and, and that which is borrowed, uh, or that which would be seeming to be lost, can be recovered. Uh, in the early church, this passage became an allegory for our own sense of being lost in our sin. And we think that it's, um, it's gone. It, it, it's something that can never be returned. And then you have God who wants to know where we are. Uh, you've got a connection similar to, say, in the garden when Adam and Eve have sinned and God is walking in the cool of the garden asks, where are you? And, and they're hiding in shame. There's these uh, constant stories in the scripture of something that's lost, something that's for, uh, 
who would appear gone forever, and that the men of God never consider it gone forever. They are always wanting to know where it is, how to, and, and, and bring it back to recovery. So this passage, as you think, how does uh, seven verses in 2 Kings chapter 6 matter? This becomes one of those stories of kind of piece upon piece of always being reminded that God cares about things that are lost. And so that's one of the ways that this story fits into the larger narrative of what Elisha is doing. He's, he's letting the sons of the prophets know that, that what you've lost is not lost ever if God is involved. Now the man who lost the axe head seems to be sensitive to the fact that he lost something that belonged to someone else. And that debt could only be paid through a miraculous work and power of God. Miracles are done as a sign, an indicator, a witness that becomes fulfilled in Christ. All right, so I've given you a little bit of a hint. Sometimes I do this. I write a question, and then as I'm teaching the Bible story, I forget about the next question. <laughs> and so I take some of the thunder out of this question. But maybe we can still find some lightning in this question. How can this story become an allegory for the work of Jesus? So, you've got this son of the prophet. He's building the house of, uh, of a house of study for uh, all the prophets. He loses an axe head. He says, alas, master, it was borrowed. He doesn't say, please find it, please help me. It's just this complete sense of exasperation. Uh, and then Elisha asks, where did it fall? He showed him the place. He cut off a stick, threw it in there, and made the iron float. All right, so let's. What is the stick about? Connect this to Jesus in an allegorical <coughs> way. The stick gets thrown into the water. Uh, what is the stick? The cross. There you go. There we go. We could that could preach. You've got a stick. Uh, what's the the water? So. Let, let's remember specifically, where are they cutting these trees from? What water are they nearby? Jordan. The Jordan, the Jordan River. So the Jordan River would be a, a place of baptism. Uh, in, in baptism, uh, what is drowned? People are drowned. The old sinful self is drowned. So waters have kind of this sense of death to them. You drown the old sinful Adam. But what, what emerges out of the waters is a new creation in Christ. That which was lost becomes found. So let's let's now connect the, the stick and the waters. How do you get out of the waters of baptism? How do you get out of being drowned? Ron, what was the stick about again? The cross. The cross. So all right. So I am a drowning <coughs> sinful self. How do I get out of drowning? Through the cross. Through the cross. That the only way that I can emerge out of being lost, the only way I can emerge from being drowning, is through Christ on the cross. So this kind of allegorical reading um, is one of the ways you can start to see miracles are signs, indicators, types that will find a near-term fulfillment, but then find full fulfillment in the work of Christ. And so the near-term fulfillment of this miracle how does it help everyone that this axe head was found? What does that do for, for God in 2 Kings chapter 6? So we've talked about kind of the big picture of Christ and the cross and baptism. But now let's think in chapter 6, what does this do? Like practically speaking? Mm -hmm. So practically speaking, the miracle means they can keep working. Uh, there's not a big summary statement at the end of this miracle. It's not like, and then they went all happily ever after. We just move on to the next verse, uh, once when the king of Syria. So the story itself seems to have its kind of independence from the things around it, but it also gives us uh, something about the character of Elisha. What do we learn about Elisha in this story? He cares about little stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't matter to Elisha. But it really mattered to this guy that he didn't have an axe. And that is a significant detail as we start to look at these heroes of the faith. That Elisha helps a, a nameless student recover a lost axe. And a, it, it, if you become nameless 
and you think you're a novice, and you think you're, you're so low in the totem pole that the master is not going to hear you. But and you do something really stupid, like lose your axe. Like, yeah. you know, what was he doing? Was he How can you lose an axe then? Right. In the water yeah. while you're cutting down a tree. This is a, a bad axe cutter guy. If you don't get that, but how, how close was I? I suppose this log was pretty close to the water. Yeah. Too. Maybe he was even standing. But I'm in sure. I'm sure when he I saw it fly it off. off several times. All right. All right. I'm not cutting any trees near you, Denny. Axe has been falling off all the time around you. <laughs> but yeah. So God cares about the little things, and he, he cares about the little things through his servants that seem to. I mean, he's got a name, Elisha. We remember him. He's got chapters devoted to him, and yet he cares about that little axe head. It also seems like nothing faces him. Okay, where did he fall? And then in the next thing, okay, Lord, open his eyes. And I, yeah. okay. Let's now look at Matthew chapter 9. And we're going to get a sense of uh, our own sins or debts. So Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 to 13. So this is uh, Jesus calling Matthew, and uh, then people are upset that Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners, reclining at a table with all these sinners. And so when Jesus hears the complaining from the uh, Pharisees that he's eating with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus says when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. If we have no sin or debt, then Christ cannot relieve you of what you claim not to have. So who did Jesus come to save? Sin. He, came to, he came to relieve and comfort sinners. And, and so you put into context, why is Elisha in this story? Because this is what God has done. God has come into this world through his servants to rescue and to save those who are lost and in debt. It's, it's not that this son of a prophet, this student that has lost his ex head, is a, a burden and an outlier in the story of Elisha. This is precisely who Elisha is. Elisha is someone who comes to help people who have a debt. All right, now, going back to 2 Kings. detail in the story that becomes helpful for maybe understanding our own relationship to what Christ accomplishes. There's lots of ways this miracle could have gone. So the axe head's in the water. He shows Elisha the spot. And, and maybe it just is immediately delivered right out of the axe handle with perfect uh, attachment. But that's not how the miracle goes. So what's, what happens... So the stick goes into the water, the axe head floats. What's the next thing that's in this story that shows us um, something about how God's miracles are working? Well, he had to pick it up. He had to do something. He had to do something. So God does, through Elisha, this amazing miracle. The axe head floats in the water. Uh, this iron, and, and this is where you get this emphasis of the iron floats. And then he said, take it up. And so then... The, the student had to reach out his hand and take it. He had to get wet into the water to pick it up. He, now, connect this with an allegory. Uh, there comes a point where you stop just talking about baptism, and someone has to actually get into the water. And uh, there in the water, it's still God's miracle that's making everything possible. The ex head is floating through God's miracle, but the student has to get into the water to get it. it it's not just an academic exercise. To go look at that, isn't that nice? See that accent floating. But he he, he goes to get. Um, yes, Barb. Does that <clears throat> does that go to give some um, credence to the reformed Christians who say that man has to do something in order to be saved? This looks in that language of if we say faith is. Uh, what receives the gift of salvation. And someone will say, well, then isn't faith a work? And so we have to kind of understand uh, the, the um, 
The miracle in this is that the axe head is floating. Um, if God removes that miracle, then any of the activity of the man is meaningless. So the meaning of the work in baptism is always the activity of God. But it's faith that receives the gift of baptism. So it's uh, not just water, uh, it's not just plain water, it's, it's water combined with God's word and received through faith. And so faith itself is not um, a work that creates, it's not a faith that accomplishes, faith is not a work that, um, that makes a difference between yes and no, but it receives it all. And I think that's, that's probably where I wonder sometimes if, um, if there's some movement between Lutherans and uh, decision-based theology is to try to figure out what does that word faith mean. And I know I had a friend of mine who I played soccer with, and he and I would talk a little bit about his, his church's practice of adult baptism, believer baptism. And uh, I, I would talk to him about infant baptism, and he would say, well, what is the infant doing in baptism? And, and then, you know, we talked about all this, and uh, I realized that, that how we describe faith became the big hurdle for him. We're going to move on now to the next story. Uh, so there's another story here in chapter 6. This one is uh, a little bit different than in verse 24. You're going to have another story about the king of Syria. But in, in chapter 6, verse 24, the king of Syria gets a name, Ben-Hadad. But here, 8 through 23, it just is... Uh, uh, an anonymous king of Syria. Uh, the king of Syria and, and the Syrians have become kind of a foil for a number of the stories involving Elisha. We had in chapter 5, Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Syria, and, and there again the name of the king in chapter 5 wasn't mentioned. Um, but we, we get Ben-Hadad as that name of a king um, back in... First Kings, um, back in First Kings chapter, uh, what is that? Chapter twenty. You've got the Ben Hadad in, in there, and then as well, um, I think Ben Hadad comes up in chapter twenty-two, or is he just kind of nameless the king there? It's just interesting. Some people find it trying to figure out um, which king of Syria are they talking about in these stories where the name is it mentioned and is in chapter 6 verse 24 is that the same ben that's been king all along and why is his name mentioned in verse 24 and not elsewhere here's the answer I got I don't know <laughs> but let's go on now with chapter 6 verse 8 once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel he took counsel with his servants saying at such and such a place shall be my camp but the man of God sent word to the king of Israel Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him, and thus he used to warn him, so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. And the man of the king of Syria was greatly troubled, and I'm sorry, the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. It was told him, Behold, he is in Dothan. So he went there, horses and chariots and a great army, and he came by night and surrounded the city. And the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out. Behold, an army with horses chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way. 
and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. And as soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And as soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He answered, You shall not strike them down. But you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow, set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to the master. So he prepared for them a great feast. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. The Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. So, in the story, we've got some cooperation between Elisha and the monarch of Israel, the king. Why might he give the king of Israel this information about the movements of Syria? Because they're setting up ambushes. So they're setting up ambushes against the king of Israel, and Elisha protects the king of Israel. And yet we know from other passages that the kings of Israel are not always so good. I mean, isn't it still God's chosen line, though? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, well, this would be God's chosen line uh, that would be kept preserved in the lines of the kings of Judah, but still God's people. And so there's, there's this notion of uh, some nationalism, some patriotism, uh, but more importantly, that uh, this is still the land of promise, that uh, Elisha is not someone that seeks the downfall of Israel. He ultimately does seek the best for the people. Now the king of Syria was mystified and he believed that he had a traitor in his midst. Why should he believe that Elisha is the culprit? This is an interesting thing of how quickly uh, you get all of his uh, servants in front of him and he says, which one of you is a traitor? And they answer, none of us. There's this guy, Elisha, in Israel. And he hears everything that's in your bedroom. And what is the reaction of the king of Syria to this news? Go get him. Go get him. It's, it's kind of strange, to be honest, that he would so quickly believe the, this mystical activity of a prophet in a faraway country can hear what's going on in his bedroom. But he does. So why do you think that is? Why does he believe? He's a foreign king. He's probably a little superstitious with all these like witches and whatnot. Right, so maybe there's just this, this um, there's a space for this belief that there's a spiritual world, and there are spiritual things happening. Um, and Elisha seems to be well known. Um, they, 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 the story starts with the namelessness in verse 9. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel. You don't hear who this man of God is. Uh, at the beginning of the story when he's talking to the king of Israel. Even the name of the king of Syria and the name of the king of Israel remains nameless. But the servants to the king of Syria all know the name of the prophet. And so there's uh, some purposeful storytelling here of anonymity among the names of the servants, anonymity by the king of Syria, anonymity of the king of Israel. But there's one name everybody knows. And that's Elisha's name. So there's some evidence that as Elisha became this guy that just even, you know, brings up axe heads out of water, he's also someone that's internationally known. Let's turn our study sheet to question three. What is the king of Syria's plan to get Elisha, and why should it work? So his plan, first of all, he asks, um, where is he? And they say he is in Dothan. So what does he say to Dothan? Horses and chariots and a great army. Horses and chariots are kind of the high-tech army portion. So he's not just sending lots of people. He's sending the best of his technology. Um, and so the horses and chariots are going. Should this work? Yeah. Howard? Isn't he really seeking Elisha to be on his side? I don't if see that. If you're sending your, your mighty tools of conquer. This is, I think, rather than to seize Elisha, I think it shows how powerful he thinks Elisha is, that he requires this much. I don't think there's any evidence that he plans to utilize Elisha as his own pet. 
Now Elisha's servants are afraid, but Elisha is not. What was the difference between these two? So Elisha sees something, and the servant does it, right? Verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. This would give us evidence that Elisha does see, but that uh, the servant does not. So what two miracles does Elisha preserve, uh, perform? So in verse 17, what's the miracle that's performed? Uh, and really, it's not Elisha himself in his own ability, but it's... It never was. It never was. It's, but here we get the specificity. It's the Lord that opened the eyes that he may see. And what does the servant see? He does some eldritch Lovecraftian peering into the unseen world. Yeah, there is some Dungeons and Dragons kind of uh, reality here. It's a reminder to the servant, there is always more at work in this world than you imagine you can see. There is more. So there's these horses and chariots of the Lord that are also there. Do these horses and chariots come into the story again? Uh, no. They don't. So what function do the horses and chariots of the Lord provide in this story? Strengthen the faith of the servant? They strengthen the faith of the servant. And, and they in the beginning, it would appear Elisha did see them. So Elisha is able to be at calm, be at peace, because he knows the Lord is there. The presence of the Lord creates uh, a significant uh, peace of calm for the servant and for Elisha. Why is the calm for the servant necessary, do you think? It, it involves probably the next miracle. So the next miracle, so we've got the eyes of the servant are opened, and then there's a, uh, a yin and a yang, kind of an opposite miracle that happens. Whose eyes are closed? Syrians. The Syrian army's eyes are closed. If the servant had remained in a panic, and that panic had spread to all of Dothan, it could be that the miracle of the eyes closing uh, would be pushed against the, the noise of the panic in the town. By keeping the servant at peace, by keeping the people of the city at peace, then the men can, can walk through their blind to everything that's going on. They don't hear any panic, they don't hear anything, and they don't see anything, so they think it's nothing. And it, so they're blind to what's going on, and so there's this miracle of blindness. Um, and for whose benefit is the blindness now? So we looked at the miracle of the opening of the servant's eyes, and that's for the benefit of the servant, so he would not be panicked. To whom uh, is the benefit of the, the blindness now applied? Who gets that benefit? The Israelites. The Israelites do. They now don't have a, a marauding army attacking the people. The story of vision and blindness, how does this help us? as the people of God. So as you read the story, what may be a connection for you in this story? Let's first look at the vision that the servant receives. When is this necessary in your own life, to have this kind of vision? When you're feeling outnumbered. When you're feeling outnumbered, it's important to be able to see the communion of saints, the, the gathered people of God, and know I'm not alone. So, like even in the book of Philippians, Paul writes, um, I thank my God always in remembrance of you. Why does Paul write to the Philippians with thanks? Because Paul's in prison, but the Philippians have sent him a gift and have let him know you're not alone. Paul finds encouragement in his imprisonment knowing that his work isn't in vain, that he can have plenty or he can have want, and God can still be at work in what he's doing. And so the vision of the young man is helpful. But I always find it remarkable that that great army that he sees don't do anything. Uh, it's an, a, a, a fascinating part of the story as we think about our own vision and confidence that we're not alone, that the communion of saints is with us, that God's army is surrounding us, 
the whole company of heaven is with us, and yet they don't attack that army of Syrians. That while I'll see strength in the, the fellowship, that doesn't mean that fellowship has to always pick up swords to be important. All right, now the blindness. How might this help be helpful? So think about our own lives. When would this blindness of the Syrian army that comes in Dothan to seize Elisha that then are traveled to um, Samaria, what, what might be a, a present tense context for that kind of blindness? This one's, I think, a little bit harder. Barry? I'm thinking in terms of problems and solutions, of seeing the real problem without seeing the solution. Tell me more. There's a way out of this. I don't know what it is yet. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. So the, the army comes, and they are a strong army. And yet Elisha has confidence that there's a way to do this. And you'll notice the effect of the blindness and being able to take them to Samaria. What happens when they're in Samaria? The king of Israel, what does he do for all these POWs? Well, he's a great feast. Yeah, and it, it's feast is the word that's used, right? Mm -hmm. A great feast in verse 23. What effect does that great feast have in the relationship between Israel and Syria? Well, apparently nothing, because literally the next verse, they go and attack him again. <laughs> yeah. The Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. They didn't raid. They came with a whole army. But um, it would seem that the, the heart of the king of Israel is, is open to the idea that you don't always have to pick up a sword to defeat your enemy. And so uh, we could think that it'd be really nice if that our enemies could be blind to the worldly power that they have and, and just enter into our, our houses and we give them peace. Um, there is a, an openness to all of this. Now, so the king of Israel's eyes were also blind to what to do. He said, what should I do? He didn't know the answer. He was blind to his choices and finally... Uh, it was Elisha said, you don't kill him. Denny? I was kind of confused by that. He's taking them to Samaria, and yet it talks about the king of Israel seeing them. So Samaria and Israel are synonymous terms. Samaria is the capital city in Israel at this time, but it also, in many scripture passages, will be used as a reference to the whole region. So when he takes them into Samaria, he's taking them into the capital of Israel. And that's where the king of Israel is located. Got it. Yeah. Let's now look at 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 31, to kind of understand a little bit about this great feast. So 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 31. here is that Ben-Hadad has been defeated uh, back in 1 Kings chapter 20 and they're trying to uh, manipulate the kindness of Israel. His servants said to him, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us put sackcloth around our waist and ropes on our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will spare your life. So Releasing the POWs in 2 Kings chapter 6, in verse 23, helps to build and emphasis the integrity of the reputation that the kings of Israel are merciful. So in 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 31, there's a reputation that the kings of Israel are merciful. 2 Kings chapter 6, that reputation we find is not out of left field. But we also find where does that reputation get built and encouraged from? It was Elisha that told the king of Israel to be merciful. The reputation that the king of Israel is merciful is a reputation built on the continued uh, presence of the word of God in Israel. That Israel becomes known as a merciful place because Elisha is continuing to nurture that idea. 
All right, we're going to now go to the Siege of Samaria. They were just kind of following the uh, Geneva Convention, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> they were. <coughs> There's a reputation for uh, that sense of battle versus non-battle uh, relationship. Afterward, ben king of Syria, mustered his entire army and went up and besieged Samaria. There was a great famine in Samaria as they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and the fourth part of a cob of, dove, of a dove's dung for five shekels oh of silver. Now as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the lord will not help you, how shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? And the king asked her, What is your trouble? She answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And then the next day I said to her, Give your son that we may eat him, but she has hidden her son. When the king heard the words of this woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall, and all the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth beneath on his body. And he said, May God do so to me, and more also, if the heads of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remain on his shoulders today. Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. Now the king had dispatched a man from his presence, but before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, You see how this murderer has sent me, has sent to take off my head. Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door, hold the door fast against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still speaking with him, the messenger came down to him and said, This trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? When have you felt under siege or under pressure in this past year? And was it your own doing or someone else? This is that question that starts to look at the desire we have for blame. Someone has to answer for the suffering I'm going through. Who does the king think is to blame? For the siege and for the famine. Elisha. Yeah, he wants to blame Elisha. Why should Elisha be the one that receives the blame? He wants a scapegoat. He wants a scapegoat. He wants someone to blame. He doesn't want to blame himself. He doesn't want to blame himself. Elisha is the one that let the army go. He said, let's Let's feed them and let them go. You brought them here into the center of Samaria and blindness, and we could have destroyed them all. Uh, so, Elisha, your mercy has brought to us this suffering. But now let's look at verse 26 and 27. The, the king and the woman have this conversation. And there's this uh, language of Lord. So let's first look at how Lord is used by the woman. So in verse 26, Now as the king of Israel was passing by in the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help my Lord, O king. And he said, and you'll notice um, in your Bibles, the word Lord that the king says is a different typography than the way the woman spoke. What are some of the differences? So when the woman says it, the L is not capitalized, nor any of the other letters. But when the king says it, it's all capital letters. This is a hint to you that in the Hebrew, they are different words. So in Hebrew, the word for Lord is Adonai, and it's a word that means the one to whom you belong to. But when you see the Lord in all capital letters, you have um, 
the tetragrammaton, that four letter Y H W H. Uh, those are consonants, and that's given in Exodus chapter 3. When Moses sees the burning bush, and the Lord says to him, that go to Egypt to tell that Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses says, uh, when the people of Israel ask, uh, what Lord are you following? Who should I say you are? And the Lord introduces himself in saying, I am. And that phrase, I am, is the Y-H-W-H. Now, how does the word Lord get from Y-H-W-H? So it was a long tradition in the Hebrew scriptures that when you have the consonants for Y-H-W-H, you add the vowels for Adonai. And if you say that uh, the vowels for Adonai and the consonants for Yahweh, you end up with the word Jehovah, which is not a word at all. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like if you take the music for Billie Jean and you take the words for uh, my girl. You, you mash them up and you get something that just, I don't think would sound right. You realize you're hearing two different words. And so the intention was that when a person is reading this, that they would say Adonai out of respect for the divine name of God. So in English, translators try to preserve that sense of sacredness about the Tetragrammaton by not putting YHWH there, but instead putting Lord in all capital letters. So the woman says, help me, O Lord, my king. So she is saying, I belong to you. I want help from the one I belong to. Now the king answers by saying, if the one that we all belong to will help you, if the Lord, the Adonai, but he says Tetragrammaton, he says Yahweh. If the Yahweh will not help you, how shall I help you? So the king is showing what about his position in the world. So he's, he's showing his humility of his helplessness. I'm walking these walls. I am trying to look like I'm doing something. But if you ask me for help, I can do nothing. Everything is depending on what Yahweh is doing right now. And then the king asks her, what is your trouble? And then she responds with the horrific story. So what does this tell us about the severity of the famine? Very bad. Very bad. Um, so why does the king tear his robes upon hearing the woman's story? Distressing. It's a distressing story. And the king is revealing that he thinks it's distressing too. And, uh, and then when he tears his robes, uh, what are under his robes? Sackcloth. Is sackcloth. What is a sackcloth? It's an itchy burlap robe. It's, it, um, medieval ages, monks would wear something called a hair shirt. Um, and a hair shirt was uh, something that would purposely be itchy under their clothing. What is the intention of the king revealing his sackcloth? That under his robes, um, and you get the sense that he was wearing kingly robes, what is it revealing when he shows to everybody that under his robes were sackcloth? More humility. He was a suffering person along with them. He might be walking the walls in the strength of his kingly robes, but under his kingly robes, he's suffering as well. So he's trying to show to the people that he is suffering. Um, what does uh, the king's ang Why is the king angry at Elisha now? Um, we're kind of moving to the next question. Uh, so, verse 31, he said, May God do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. God can't punish God. There's no, I mean, the king can't punish God. That God is... Uh, is God. You, you, you can't punish or do anything to God that would make God suffer. And so he's going to cause um, and he's going to do this. And his expectation is that if Elisha's suffering um, may be significant enough of a suffering to make God notice what's going on. 
So I think his desire to bring suffering to Elisha isn't just anger, but it's also hope that if God didn't hear the cry of this woman and the, the sadness of her son being boiled, maybe God will notice when his own prophet is killed. So he's torn, he's torn his robes, he's now going to say, let's try this. They're all efforts of um, amplifying the distress of the city in such that God hopefully will notice. What is the reaction of Elisha to this news? So what does Elisha tell the elders to do? Keep out the messenger. Um, bar the doors. Hold them fast. Now let's think about the fourth commandment for a second. What's the fourth commandment? Honor your father, your father and your mother. So uh, this is a, a commandment to honor all of those whom God has placed in authority over us. How does Elisha barring the door and preventing the messenger of the king from arriving in the room connect to the fourth commandment? Is he disobeying the fourth commandment by barring the door? Probably, yeah. In a way, yeah. I mean, if on the straight level of it, the king is the authority of Elisha. He's the king of Israel. Uh, the messenger of the king carries the full weight and power of the king, and Elisha's not going to let him in. But he's keeping the king from doing a rash thing, right? He is, yeah. So, so barring the door is him. protecting the king from doing something Himself. stupid? Well, think about the other half of that commandment. What does it say? Honor your father and mother, so it shall go with you in all your days. So that you shall have long life and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So yeah, he's gonna not honor so that he will have a longer life. <laughs> yeah. So the the idea of the fourth commandment is keep this commandment because life is preserved and protected when we honor the authorities that God has placed in our lives. But when you have an authority that is violating life, when you have an authority that is breaking the command to preserve and protect long life, then you get the counterbalance. Then don't honor him. And this gets to our own sense of when should we disobey the authorities? When our authorities are not preserving and protecting life. There is a command then to, to preserve, to protect, to act, um, to hold fast. Faced with the choices of this woman in this story, so there's a famine, there's a negotiation. We're trying to figure out what could the woman have done differently? Did she have a choice? Well, I mean, so if you've got these two women, they both have got babies, and one says, boil your son today and we'll boil my son tomorrow, I suppose the woman could say, well, how about your son today instead of my son? They flipped a coin. Yeah. Um, oh, they don't have any coins. Never mind. They're, uh, they're, they're we really got the poor. shekels. We know how expensive well, the, poor, the donkey is. Everyone's um, spent all their money. Even odds. Even odds. Um, she, she could have tested the integrity of the woman, I suppose. She could have just said no. There is a suffering that sometimes we must undergo as well. How could these people have lived in this time of famine? It's essentially finding a way to... Always protect the ones whom God has placed in your life. And that becomes the way you make it through a darkness like that. It's, it's a terrible story. There is no, no moment to it where you think this is what everyone should have done during that famine. How might God use a hard situation like this to bring about a change in people's lives. So when the king heard about this, the king took off his robes and showed everybody his sackcloth. He went from walking the walls with his kingly robes to walking his robes, walking the walls with his sackcloth. He had a change of heart. He realized that people did not need to see him as the big, powerful king. Because when the woman reveals all this, he finds out how powerless he is. He was more effective, maybe as a king, when he was humble. 
it's a, a difficult thing to try to think, but can God be at work in the story of that woman? Is there any spot where God's at work in that story? Change the heart of the king. Yeah. Changes the heart of the king. He takes off his robes. Um, doesn't change it completely because now he wants to kill Elisha. But uh, we start to see maybe there's this sense of in this famine, um, we can't just pretend our way through the famine like everything's fine. Wear your fancy robes and prance on the walls. There is sometimes an acknowledgement of hopelessness that's necessary in a time. That's a hard thing to imagine, though. Verse 7, I mean chapter 7, verse 1. Um, the messenger said, The trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. When it becomes its darkest moment, Elisha says, It's not going to be this way forever. Tomorrow is going to be different. So one of the ways that Elisha is going to lead the people through this famine it was with the encouragement that today is not the way it will be forever. There is a tomorrow. And, and then that tomorrow is actually what happens. Um, and we'll see the way they are rescued is uh, the Syrians are, are, are gone. Let's jump ahead to chapter 7, verse 6. So we remember when the Syrian army of horses and chariots came to Dothan, Elisha prayed that the servant's eyes would be opened and he would see the horses and chariots. But then I asked you, did those horses and chariots do anything? And we all said, no, they did nothing in that story. Look at chapter 7, verse 6. The Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots of horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel is hired against us, the king of the Hittites and the king of Egypt, to come against us. They fled away in twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was, and they fled for their lives. The horses and chariots in chapter 6 that seem to have done nothing do have some work to do. They do come back into the story later. But it comes after considerable darkness. And this is that struggle. If God always had this army uh, horses and chariots and armies that were always there. Why do they wait? This is one of the tensions that's in this story. Why do they wait? All right, we're going to look at that question of why they wait next week. So come back next week. Let's pray with closure with the confidence that God is with us. Sustain us, O Lord, against the sieges of the devil, our doubts, and the world's temptations. Open our eyes be able to see the horses and chariots that surround us. Open the ears of our enemies, that they may hear your forces that protect and care for us. And Lord, in all of this, help us know that today is not forever. There is always yet still a tomorrow. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.